Welcome to the Women's March Canada podcast, making the equality of women in Canada the new norm. This is episode 35, entitled Sustainable Materials and Mindset. My name is Leanne Castellino, and I'm your host, uniting, inspiring, and leading the charge for the advancement of women across Canada. Please welcome our guest this week, Lauren Smith. Lauren is the founder and CEO of Polygon Technologies. It's a company which develops products uh, uh, that are designed to address microfiber contamination. Specifically, their products catch microfibers that are released from clothing during the washing process. Lauren, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to lend my story. <laughs> So let's start off with what do you think that people need to know about microfibers in general as it relates to their health? Sure. Um, it's a really good question because I think a lot of people still don't know about the microfiber problem and don't know what they are at all. Uh, people are kind of familiar now with microplastics. Um, plastic is getting a lot of attention lately all over uh, the news and across the world but microfibers are still pretty unknown. Whenever I try and speak to people about it, it's still kind of something people don't know. Uh, but what they are, are tiny plastic threads that are released from the washing of synthetic textiles. So polyester, fleece, uh, acrylics, nylons, anything that's not a natural fiber is essentially made of plastic. So these tiny fibers are released and end up in our environment. And then here, they are not only eaten by the wildlife, but they're also showing up in a lot of our food and beverage. So our drinking water, our bottled water, uh, beer, honey, salt. And the particularly bad part is that when they're in the environment, they collect just toxins. So those pesticides, chemicals, and they stick to all these plastic fibers and kind of increase the concentration of the food chain. And so the exact consequences for human consumption of these fibers isn't really known yet, but these chemicals have been linked to things like diabetes and cancer. Uh, so there's a lot of potential human health risk involved and it's kind of a big issue that again people don't really know about yet so trying to really stop i, I don't I know personally i would rather not ingest these plastics so that's why we're trying to try to capture them and stop the release of more of them first so most people don't know about this yet how did you find out about it Sure. So about a year ago, I, uh, I was involved in an aqua hacking competition. So kind of like a hackathon for water issues specifically. So last year they focused on Lake Erie in 2017. And I grew up really near Lake Erie. So I thought that was a really interesting area to look at. And then I also did my master's in sustainability management with water, uh, human behavior change around water. So thought there was something like maybe I could contribute here. And I found out that one of the streams was microplastics. So focusing on how do we solve the microplastic problem for Lake Erie specifically. And then through that, found out that microfibers were actually closer to 94% of, um, of all microplastic pollution. And again, there was no real solution for this problem yet. So did a lot more research and found, kind of found out all of this information about the problem with no real, real answer. Well, as you go around speaking and meeting people and growing your business, what strikes you about the reaction you get from people who hear about this, perhaps for the first time? Yeah, uh, people are really surprised. Um, sometimes people think, oh, that makes so much sense. Of course, my clothing is made of plastic. Of course, there's some consequences here that I may not be familiar with. Um, but generally, people are also thankful that we're doing something about it, which is, which is nice to... Um, hear that you're doing a good thing for sure uh, but yeah definitely mostly a reaction of, of surprise of people not knowing it was even a problem. Let's talk about the products a little bit uh, that you've got uh, on the market. Can you describe first of all what they are and what they do and how they address this issue? Sure well I should uh, clarify first we're not on the market yet uh, as a startup company we're still in the in the product development and some R&D. So we're working uh, kind of on two main things first with our uh, filtration materials. We're working on a washing machine filter. So something you can attach to the back hose of your washing machine or ideally new washing machines will come with this already installed. Um, so a filter that you can replace kind of like your, your dryer, your lint screen and your dryer. Uh, so something easy to use like that. So it just stops all the fibers from coming out. And then we're also working on a laundry add-in, so like a dryer sheet before your washing machine, and something that you can just toss in with your laundry, clean it out occasionally, and then again, it'll need replacement over time. But uh, kind of two laundry approaches first to kind of stop more from getting out. Down the road, uh, it would be really 
we have plans and potentially to adapt the filter material or filter to to stop fibers already in the environment to get into our food and beverage. Um, but of course, that's dealing with then filtering a product for human consumption. So there's a few more hurdles involved and uh, so kind of working on prevention first. So let's talk a bit more about that product development. Give us a sense of what's involved in your process with the rest of your company. Sure. It's a, it's a lot of fun and kind of a little unique space because it's such a new issue. There's no standard for testing already. There's no existing protocol to follow. Um, we can kind of look at the, the few studies that are out there and, and try and base, uh, we based our like lab development off of that. So we're working in lab space through Velocity Science, which if you're not familiar, is an incubator for, for startup companies um, that have a science background so that they need access to equipment and lab space. They provide that. So we have that. We have our own little permit washing machine that we do a lot of laundry in. And so like the first step was really establishing what the baselines were for the water that we're working with and the machine that we use and the synthetic products that we were base testing with. So seeing what is initially coming out, uh, what is being released in that first, and then seeing we tested a whole bunch of different materials to see what would be good at filtering this out. What do we want to start with? And so did a lot of, a lot of testing, a lot of different things tested a lot of the different competitor products that were available. And then once we found what worked really well, kind of adapted from there. So we found there was a particular, uh, a particular material that we found had a really high capture rate of the microfibers. So we worked with that and then tried to recreate kind of our own version of it to make it, you know, last longer and that. So we're still working out what specific um, like specifications we want to ensure have on every single uh, filter. So. Yeah, so that's kind of where we're at right now. So give us a sense as an all-female, all-Canadian company in a very niche emerging area, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've had to face and overcome? Totally. There's been quite a few, I would say. Uh, we're kind of in, in like extra unique little space, but particularly in the Waterloo region, it's um, very tech-based, very for, for the startup scene, right? Um, there's not a ton of other clean tech companies, not a ton of people working in sustainability. A lot of traditionally startups are software companies, so not people trying to make a physical product. So there's a few extra hurdles kind of to get through there, but it's a little more difficult to tell your story and convince people that you have a good idea and that are worth perhaps um, I don't know, investing in or, or trusting. Uh, so there's those initial ones, and then with that comes with traditionally there's traditionally men in STEM, and there's not so many women in STEM, so you're kind of a little more isolated in that. It's a little harder to get the support, maybe. Um, so, so it's been a, definitely a bit of a challenge, but you kind of find other people that are in the same uh, pocket. So we've also been involved with St. Paul's Greenhouse, which is a incubator type idea, but specifically for social motivated or socially minded companies or ventures. So through that, there's been, I've met some other startups or people starting on different ideas but that already understand the whole social background and like okay yeah you're doing something for good it's not necessarily about how many dollars you can make but you're trying to make the world a better place uh so that's just it's you gotta like find your little pockets that have your little support networks in there so they're right there just sometimes it takes a little while to find them yes definitely um give us a sense of some of your short-term and long-term goals uh, for the company Sure. Um, so we recently hired our first co-op student, which is which is great. Uh, so we can start making the the testing process move along a little faster and get that. Uh, we've, we've kind of spent the summer trying to raise some money to be able to do that. Um, so the short-term goal is to ensure they get trained well and have a good time also. I want to make sure it's a good working environment for them. And uh, we're really working on trying to get our, we have our like initial prototypes done, so to show people what we're doing and have proven that it works in the lab, but we want to get our next um, prototype kind of ready to use for someone to try it, take home, try out at home, see how they like it. Um, that's kind of our first relatively short-term goal. And then long-term, uh, getting a pilot project going with either, we've talked to a few industries that are interested, so either a pilot project, you know, in a condo development or in a neighborhood, get a whole group of people to try them out or work with, you know, a laundry machine manufacturer would be great to try and get that, get a filter design specifically for what they want, work with them, get sure it's just kind of make that, you know, entryway into the marketplace a little easier.
It's really interesting because your background is, is quite fascinating in terms of the degrees you have and the type of, sort of academic footprint that you've made so far, degrees in psychology and uh, philosophy and environment assessment and water management. It, it's quite um, a unique and eclectic mix, some would say. How has all of that informed what you do now as an entrepreneur? in this space yeah it's uh certainly not something i ever would have expected um i didn't i didn't even get involved in this aqua hacking competition with the idea of starting a company or starting a business but uh that's what happened um and it's been definitely an interesting journey and at the end you can see how kind of all the things i've done do contribute a lot and like make sense uh, like my psychology background when I started it I was thinking just about counseling and things like that but um, my master's was all about behavior change and a lot of this company now is like we're asking people to do their laundry a little differently so that is some behavior change involved um, and even you know the industry is asking them to think about their manufacturing a little differently by incorporating this sustainable aspect um, so it all kind of contributes and it works together in the end which is really great and even I wouldn't have um, so in my master's, I did a specialization program called the Collaborative Water Program, and it, got, it gets um, people from all different fields working together on various water issues and learning about water management, essentially, in very different ways. And you get engineers and biologists and environmentalists and ecologists and geographers and architects all into the same room working on problems and all see the problem a little differently. So having that experience really prepares you to kind of talk to people from all different backgrounds again about your idea and that's like a key part is being able to communicate well so i think that really helped out and then that's also where i met my co-founder so uh we wouldn't it be here without her for sure <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely um can you give us a sense of you know all female company um was that by design or did that occur naturally definitely uh just happened uh when we started the aqua hacking competition it was um like it like an idea uh experiment so there was some other uh it was a different team there were five of us again all women um and then they decided to not pursue it as a company which is fine um and and that was just i don't know it just kind of happened that we were all females i think maybe water is a special field that tends to attract women for whatever reason on already um uh, i'm not sure why but uh it just happens to be that way, I think. And then when the company moved forward, like we incorporated with just myself and my partner, um, she had been volunteering and helping me out already a lot. So already a good basis. And then also my co-founder is my partner in real life as well. So it kind of makes it a, a, a good, I don't know, a different experience, I guess. Um, you learn about each other more, that's for sure. <laughs> totally. It's uh, Yeah, it's definitely hard sometimes to like shut off the work or like switch you have to definitely set the hours of when you're going to stop talking about business. But um, it, I think it kind of helps in a lot of ways because if you suddenly have an idea, you, you can instantly get that feedback right away, which is good and bad for sure. But um, mostly good when we have it, have the figured it out uh, when we want to talk about it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I find it really interesting um, when you talk about your background and all the sort of the different um, degrees and things and education that you've gone through and then the curiosity that led you to where you are but what was the moment where you said you know what i think i can turn this into a business and guess what i want to turn this into a business yeah um so we had gone through the aqua hacking competition uh got some really good feedback and people you know got the response from people saying this is a good idea like you should or like we can see how this can work and then when I got into the lab space and started doing some of the testing myself, I was like, okay, this is, this is doable. And we have something that's working really well. Um, and Nicole had, you know, got a setup going that had some reliable results. We're like, okay, we feel confident in these numbers that we're getting. Um, and then just realizing that, you know, we, we can make this work and seeing how it was very doable. And the initial idea we thought we'd have to work with um, some sort of chemical application to try and get the plastics to stick to the material. Um, and I don't have a chemistry, all of my schooling, I don't have a chemistry background. So I wasn't sure if I was able to do it um, at that, that I felt more like less certain then, but then finding we could get good results without having to do that. And I was like, okay, this is something we can, we can do. And 
um, kind of talking to, I did some like an entrepreneurship course and I was like, okay, how do I, what are the steps involved? What do I need to do to do this? And kind of having that bit of guidance to see, okay, there's lots of people that kind of start out and don't know, essentially don't know what they're doing or just have an idea um, and still manage to go from there. So I think kind of seeing that there's people that do that already kind of made it seem more doable for me. And I realized that I really enjoyed it also. Um, kind of trying it the first few pitch competitions and presenting to people. I would also a few years ago, I've never thought I would get up on a stage and present to people without like a book in front of me with words <laughs> because I would be too scared of forgetting it. But then practicing it and realizing that I can do it kind of, I don't know, it's a, it's a tricky one to be like, you didn't, you don't know you can do it until you actually try and do it. Uh, and then when I tried to do it and, and was successful, it's like, okay, this isn't so bad. <laughs> When you go around meeting people, whether it's, uh, you know, business uh, relationships that you're forming or just presenting, you know, the idea that these toxins exist and, and are re-entering our bloodstream, what, what do you say to people that you think is probably the most impactful to them about how big an issue this is? I think... I think what really kind of brings it home for people is that this is coming from your clothes. Like everybody is wearing clothing of some type and generally there's some synthetic materials involved. Even the most sustainably minded people, it's very difficult to only have clothing that are natural fibers. So it kind of is involved in everybody no matter what. It's kind of, and then it's also tied to your food. So the connection that it's in their everyday lives, I think is what really gets people interested and realize the scope of the problem and that it's literally everywhere. Like even when you start thinking about the plastics in general, like you look around you, there's plastics in all over your, your room, no matter where you are, they're really unavoidable. And so I think that aspect of it kind of gets people to really understand that this is something around them all of the time and that there's really not, not a lot being done about it so far. And, and that it, it's not in your mind until you actually start thinking about it and looking for it. Well, and some of the statistics are pretty you know, pretty eye-catching, right? Yeah, definitely. And there's more studies coming out every day, really, about where, how many of these fibers are around us, in what different food sources they're being found in, um, and and microplastics in general, just people are finding more and more and more. So knowing what you know and being the entrepreneur that you are in this space, how has your lifestyle or your habits around you know, clothing and how it's washed changed? Yeah, like I... Um, I've been, well, part, I guess a mixture of being in the environment field and then also being a student, I've always bought, you know, used clothes and try to make things last as long as possible uh, to try and minimize my impact and also save some dollars. Um, so learning about the problem for sure makes you certainly more aware of the labels. Um, you know, I thought I lived a fairly environmentally friendly life, lifestyle, but then actually looking at the labels of my clothing, I realized that, yeah, for sure, most of this is synthetic. Um, there are some cotton or, or natural fibers out there but they're certainly not as common as you know they should be for someone trying to look who like call themselves environmentalists so that certainly opened my eyes a bit to the problem for sure so what should we be doing as consumers in terms of what kinds of clothing to buy etc yeah for for dealing with this in particular looking for brands that or for if you read the label and it's a natural fiber so anything you know, cotton, wool, hemp, these fibers that will biodegrade in the environment because um, those aren't, aren't plastic, right? So those are better. Um, but then also tied with, you know, fashion, sustainable fashion, there's a lot of ethical and human rights issues tied up in it as well. So there's a few different organizations that try and make it a little easier to find clothing that, um, you know, is fair trade and things like that. It takes a little bit of legwork and a little bit of research, but being aware for the vast or the large problem of sustainable fashion is certainly something somewhere to start just to be looking at the labels and googling the brands that you like kind of and be like okay what are their practices are they doing anything to offset their problem um and then otherwise there's there's some research into how to better care for your synthetic clothing to kind of reduce the microfibers that come out so some studies say that you have a front load washing machine that releases releases less fibers than a top load washing machine um, but that's not something that's very easy to change if you already have a washing machine, they're expensive. Um, so using cold water helps as well, um, certain types of detergents. But again, there's, it's, there's still research coming out on that. So it's a little bit to be, well, there's more to learn, I think, is really the answer there. 
what would you say that the ideal world looks like for you in terms of what you do as an entrepreneur? Mm, that is a good question. Um, ideal world, uh, that we have an impact, right? Um, we're still pretty early on, um, but we're trying really hard to make a product that works really well. Uh, and, and like I said, there's, there are some existing products out there, but the testing we've done and that some other labs have done, I found that they're not, unfortunately not very effective. So we want to be able to have something that actually is doing a really good job at, at answering this problem. Um, and that's really, really all that I can ask for, right? To have something out there that's working well and that people like to use. I don't want to put, um, I was talking to someone recently about, um, I think it was like, like a Tide ball product that was put out a few years ago, to kind of like put this ball in that had your detergent in it. So you don't have to worry about it. But when people actually use it, because of how fast the washing machine turns, damages the sides of the washing machine. So that made me think about, okay, that's something else to keep in mind when we're making something that's going into a washing machine or any type of product, just thinking about the consequences that, um, or, you know, that you might not think about right away. So making sure that we talk to a lot of different people that know what's going on or that might have a different, um, a different way of thinking about the problem or the product. So... Yeah, making something that's, that's good and effective is an ideal goal. Well, we wish you all the best of luck in your future, Lauren. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. And thank you to everyone tuning in. Your comments are always welcome and encouraged. Please subscribe to our Women's March Canada channel and receive updates every time we upload a new podcast. Our mission across Canada is to stand together in solidarity with our partners and children for the protection of our rights, our safety, our health, and our families, recognizing that our vibrant and diverse communities are the strength of our country. This is the Women's March Canada podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Women's March CDA and our website, womensmarchcanada.com. My name is Leanne Castellino. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great day.